Hey everyone, my name is Evan Copelson, and we are live on our first, first ever live Hangout on Air. Uh, this is Vinyasa Homes Project TV, and again, my name is Evan Copelson. I'm going to talk about the sharing economy today with three very special guests. Uh, these are people I share space with and resources in a community known as Vin uh, Vinyasa Homes Project. Um, and we have Sean Michael Quirk and John Torma with us today, and Emma Dilemma, who's our culinary director. Sean and Michael are our co-directors, and this is going to be the first in a series of live YouTube events that we're doing, and it's going to be based in community building, and what that means is we're going to share our experiences with each other and with you guys. Uh, we're going to take questions and answers if anyone has them. In this particular show today, I'm going to be asking Sean and John and Emma to share with me the backstory of how they started this amazing community. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to tell a little bit about my personal experience finding these guys, um, how I ended up here in this amazing house in the middle of San Francisco, and then I'm going to turn it over to them. They're going to share their stories of how they know each other and how they came up with this idea to uh, create a community. And we're also going to talk more generally, like what is the sharing economy um, and what is this movement of communal living in San Francisco. There's a lot of this happening, and I believe we're at the forefront pioneering uh, a new model uh, for surviving in this economy and thriving in this economy. And I think we're doing both uh, extraordinarily well. From the short time, just a couple months that I've lived in this community, uh, I've just been amazed at every turn at how well thought out, how well conceived, and how well executed um, it is when you share space with uh, 24 people right now. We're sharing food budgets. We're eating uh, extraordinarily healthy foods. Uh, in vast amounts of quantity of really good food and far better I think than the average person can afford trying to go to the supermarket and buy their stuff on their own so I want to share that because I feel like there's so much happening here that can speak to a lot of the pain that a lot of people are feeling in this culture um, especially in big crowded cities like San Francisco um, but as the world gets more crowded, these things are becoming more important. How do we continue to enjoy a quality of life that is, frankly, beyond the financial reach of most people in the economy? Uh, it's that old thing, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and the people in the middle, who used to be the thriving middle class, are struggling in a lot of ways to put food on their table, to feed their families, to be able to have time and resources to vacation and really live that American dream um, that we've all you know heard about and maybe we experienced in our youth and things have gotten more and more difficult so uh, a little about me I'm a coach and I'm a former lawyer I've had a couple of transitions in my career and a lot of transitions in the way that I've lived I've lived everywhere from uh, amazing luxury on the beach in a huge apartment, all the way to living in a pod wrapped in vinyl under a tree in a house shared by 12 people. I did that for a year and a half. Um, I've lived, I've couch surfed for, you know, a year at a time, stayed with friends, uh, family. Uh, as I have been looking for the answer to uh, what is the journey of life and, and how do you align your career and your passions and be able to survive and live a good life um, and somehow uh, on Craigslist I found these guys I found this Vinyasa Homes project um, and we have a great website it's up at vinyasahomes.org and you can read about the houses uh, that we are uh, that are part of our project and you can see some pictures there uh, but before you know we get into any of that I'm going to introduce first uh, Sean Michael Quirk who is right now joining us from London, and Sean is, uh, you know, lives here with us and in our other house in Redwood City, and is on a uh, on a mission, on an exploration to Europe, uh, and I'm going to have Sean tell us about that. 
And uh, before we loop back and do the introductions and talk specifically about uh, Vinyasa Homes here and the sharing economy, I want to open it up to Sean, ask Sean to unmute uh, your microphone. And if you would, Sean, could you tell us, because you went to a conference in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago, I think it was called the Share Conference, and I'm just wondering if you could spend a couple minutes talking about what is the sharing economy and kind of who is involved in the sharing economy, what are the big brands of the sharing economy, and then kind of lead from there into uh, what is Vinyasa Homes and how does that fit into the sharing economy, and then we'll open it up to John as well to, uh, uh, to fill in the blanks, and then I'll go back and forth with you and John a little bit, and then um, the PS de la Resistance, last but certainly not least, we're going to open it up to Emma Dilemma um, and spend a really good deal of time with Emma today talking about the food plan, um, and she has such a huge part of our community, and I think that is going to be so interesting to so many of you who are watching, and, um, and I can't wait to get her perspective on this. So let's start uh, with Sean, plain and simple. What is the sharing economy? Uh, where did you come from? Why is it attractive to you? Um, how did you decide that you want to be part of this? And what is your vision for Vinyasa Homes? All right, awesome. Yeah, I'm happy to, happy to be here reporting in from uh, from London right now. So, um, so yeah, I guess you know a, a great example of what the sharing economy can provide is is the fact that you know me being where I am right now in in the Shoreditch district of London, just a fantastic arts district uh, with some great folks um, through Airbnb, you know, through a platform that allows me as an individual to connect with folks who are offering spaces that otherwise would be sitting unused, you know, and they're on this platform, right? And um, it really just kind of comes down to kind of creating shared value. You know, I think that depending on who you ask, the sharing economy can mean a lot of different things. It could mean, you know, something as, as, as pure and as simple as, you know, Giving you giving you something free at free of charge, or it could be or it could be something along the lines of of of, of using space and and renting that out, so, so to speak, to somebody. Um, and you know, but but yeah. So and, and kind of touched a little bit on the the share conference itself. You know, yeah, it was a few weeks ago, and um, you know, I got to learn a little bit more about not only the tools that that people are using um, to kind of activate this new economy, but but also talking about some of the success stories um, and and a little bit more about the value. Um, that one gets from being a part of the economy, you know. So it was very much just just kind of an open form of, of knowledge exchange, you know. Um, and 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 yeah. So uh, my time here in London right now has been full of kind of so far full of of, of sharing resources again, whether it be through the spaces that I'm staying or or through knowledge. You know, just earlier today I was able to attend a really fantastic um, street art walk, you know, where we just kind of walked around um, and the guy was again sharing his knowledge. Um, just just in person through um, just through a group of us, you know, and um, he was talking about so many different amazing artists in London who have, have also made their made their um, impact in other parts of the world. Uh, San Francisco included actually got to run into a really fantastic street artist, um, Ben Ein, who was actually working on this you know this probably this 50 foot long installation on the side of this warehouse. Um, you know, just completely serendipitous exchange and interaction right there. Um, you know, and um, and and yeah, so. Um, I guess to uh, go a little bit more into kind of the idea, or at least you know my my uh, perspective on on Vinyasa Homes, you know, this the idea of again creating connection um, through 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 sharing space, you know, kind of that that simple, you know, and and we've kind of you know taking it from the context of 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 living, you know, again where where you have a lot of folks who are kind of intentionally sharing space, intentionally sharing experiences. Um, and, and, you know, it kind of creates, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say an American dream that, that we, we typically kind of associate with kind of the, you know, kind of the, this idea, this notion of success around kind of the accumulation of resources um, for yourself um, in a conspicuous fashion or, you know, um, anything like that. But I guess I, you can kind of think of maybe the, the Americana, kind of the Orwellian kind of picture of a family kind of sharing a large meal together. I guess in some ways that might be um, something that it is that we do. Um, I think food is very much, and I know we'll go into this a little bit more, um, but food is very much a powerful bridge um, and very much kind of a glue that, that binds communities together, um, you know, dating all the way back to kind of the uh, the tribal 
kind of gathering around the fireplaces and the hunters and the gatherers would kind of bring together all of their all of the food that they that they managed to uh, to come with and um, and yeah so today we're kind of taking a spin on that you know using technology using economies of scale using relationships um, to to really create um, and to continue to create a really robust kind of experience that's you know that is that is very much centered around the dinner table you know or the kitchen um, but but yeah so um, so let me ask you this like uh, I'm gonna open this up to John as well and um, I'd love it if John uh, you can unmute your microphone as well so that uh, you and Sean can both speak uh, if you like and I'm gonna ask anyone in the audience who's watching this now or even after the fact this video is going to become a YouTube video and um, you can see the Q&A app uh, and you can type questions and they'll appear and we'll be able to answer them so if you hear anything on this broadcast um, and you can type a question in even afterwards we can come back and monitor that page and we can actually type questions back to you um, actually John uh, let me have you come in for a little bit and talk about where you and Sean know each other from and talk about um, how you guys decided to start a Vinyasa Homes project because take us all the way back to the first time that you signed your names on a lease because that's pretty huge. The rents are extraordinary here in San Francisco and you guys really signed your name on the line. You put your, you, you know, you put your money where your mouth is, so to speak, to create this. So um, I just, I hope everybody understands that in terms of uh, building a community, what Sean and John have done as individuals is literally put their financial worth on the line, and they signed leases that make them joint and severally liable in legal talk, which means that if they couldn't find the residents to live in the house, if people default on their rents. Um, these these fresh-faced young kids here are responsible for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars every month um, in a long-term lease. So I, I, that's an extraordinary mark of leadership. And I really want to get into that a little bit and say, you know, are you, are you guys crazy? Um, how have you known each other for so long and decided, hey, let's do this. Let's just sign for this enormous house. And was that a leap of faith or did you literally plan it out? Um, can you talk to us about that? This is John Torma, the co-founder and co-director of Vinyasa Homes. Uh, yeah, definitely. Evan, thanks for, uh, thanks for setting this up and um, for creating the space for us to come together and talk about this. My pleasure. Um, you definitely served up a big platter of questions, so hopefully I can fulfill and bring it all back together. Um, but to start it off, you, you had asked about Sean and I's connection and, and how long we've known each other, where we came from. Um, so Sean and I have been friends for 23 years now. We've been friends since we were four. And we lived at uh, opposite ends of the street, to the street, way back home in the Midwest. Um, and we always kind of worked on things together and collaborated and kind of, you know, plotted our future and talked about where we expected to be in 10, 20, 50 years. Um, and it's, it's crazy to look back and really think, like, really how long um, and how genuine the connection's been that, um, like, we've been able to come together and really, really trust in one another to try and create something like this. Um, and you had asked about like where it came from, where the idea, the first kind of risk or like the the push. Um, as you're right, I mean it does take a lot of trust, and it and it it deals with a lot of risk as well. Um, but it came about at first as just a random experiment, and so we called it a radical experiment in sharing and this co-living arrangement where down in Silicon Valley we hope to bring people together. Um, who are coming into the space on an internship or like a research grant or something, you know, Stanford's down there, there's a number of startups. It's a very collaborative, entrepreneurial, um, paradigm-shifting uh, community down there. And so we were hoping by taking some space, because we had a really large bedroom, we didn't think any one or two people would ever, would ever be able to afford the rent for, we decided to just set up a few bunks and try and host people on the short term so that they could come in 
connect with the community that we were creating and all the co like co collaborators, co creators of the initial movement. Um, we wanted to connect our local community with the wider community and, and that new blood infusion of someone coming in to work on, you know, neuroprosthesis or like cutting edge like photography. Um, and so we created the space and had people interested before we had even actually um, before we'd even actually gotten the lease completed. But it was based along uh, the general idea of if you believe in it and if you put your energy towards it, if it's going to work, it's going to work. And if it doesn't, you're going to learn something. And so that's kind of what guided us into it was the, uh, the potential to do something great was, was willing enough for us to risk picking the cherry amongst the thorns or the raspberry, you know. Um, and so, yeah, we signed the lease and then we, we had people coming in and we kind of ran out of space, but we, we so enjoyed the process, we, we wanted to maximize uh, being able to welcome people. And so we went from two bunk beds originally, four beds, to, to six, and then we started kind of like, Sean and I moved into one room, and then at one point Emma moved into the same pool house with the three of us, and so we opened up another room and added some more bunks and then converted a few single rooms into doubles. And we really kind of optimized or maximized the space uh, physically and uh, like essentially realized we were at we were at capacity. And so that's what eventually brought us into San Francisco is the idea of connecting to the art and the collaborative and the you know the uh, community scene up in San Francisco really drew off, drew us in. And so I think our one year anniversary actually for the Chate La Chateau Magalamo, which is where I'm at right now, um, we're coming up on the one-year anniversary officially in July, but we signed the lease almost exactly a year ago today um, on this this expansion. Wow! So basically, you've got two locations now, but really three, because here at Macalamo, I'm in the downstairs unit right now, and you're in the upstairs unit, mm -hmm. and uh, that's a brand new unit. I want to tell everybody that uh, you guys just signed a new lease for another year and that is doubling the space um, so when I moved in here a couple of months ago there were 10 of us and now there's 24 of us uh, with a whole new expansive uh, uh, thing upstairs it's really fantastic um, so how is it John um, it looks like we lost Sean and then he came back on um, but I'm not sure that we have him yet but so until he comes back on Talk just a little bit more before we open up to uh, Emma, because Emma's we're we're just getting into the good stuff. So you've maximized your um, and Emma. I hope you see like I'm leading all of this right into your uh, domain pretty soon because once you have all these people, right? You had how many people down in Redwood City when you were at capacity? Uh, somewhere between thirteen and sixteen, I think. Okay, so like you've got 14, Emma says. So you have 14 people, and at, at what time did you always know? Let me get Emma in here right now. Um, and John, it's, there's a lot of ambient noise on your floor for some reason. I don't know where it's coming from. Thanks for muting out. Um, so I'm going to ask Emma uh, to unmute, and I'm going to ask you, Emma, this is Emma Dilemma, our culinary director, to um, before you get into a little bit about... Um, the specifics about Redwood City. Just tell us in broad strokes a little bit about who you are um, and what your day job is as culinary director. You know, where else do you work specifically? And so that people get an idea of what kind of expertise you're actually bringing into the community here because it's huge. Um, so tell me a little bit about that and then I'm going to ask you some more questions. Hi, Evan. Thank you so much for hosting this. It's really a neat opportunity to finally kind of record like what we've been doing so far. So um, I'm fondly known as Emma Dilemma, and um, I've been with John and Sean working on this process for the last two years. When I moved in the week that they started this at um, the Redwood City property, Le Chateau McMansion, um, it was an ex experiment. I moved to um, Silicon Valley to take a job as um, 
a private chef for a sorority at Stanford, and I've been cooking for nine years. Um, when I moved in with him, though, I had just been living with an intentional community based on spiritual, non-dogmatic, artistic practice um, based out of Italy. So it was another community with like dealing with sharing, living together, creating a life together, um, connecting with one another, but um, a spiritually and artistic fo artistically focused um, community. And that was in Italy, and when I left there, I knew that I wanted to stay with being in community, and when I found these guys on Craigslist, I was like, these guys are going in that direction. <laughs> it was before it was really, even the idea of it really being an intentional community, it was still this experiment of, um, what do we do when we just get some extra people, put up some bunk beds, and see what happens? And everything from like buying food together to what time people are being noisy to when we have like social events or field trips all became these experiments for us to work on together and it's been such an amazing journey with both of them. They've been such influential people in my life and in the ideas of manifesting your dreams and um, you know just really just been a really phenomenal experience even in the most difficult times it's been so wonderful and such a privilege to work with both of them um, in this whole process. Now we are on a new journey um, in this um, really working as culinary director um, for one for all three houses and so two properties, three houses right now. Um, we are buying food for as a community and what that can kind of do for us, we can talk a little bit more about and get more into depth with, but that's really the journey we're starting on right now is looking at what ways that can benefit us and um, really up, upping the possibilities and creating a new model of uh, communal living and how to share food and commune together. Yeah, so it's really fantastic um, what you're able to do. And, you know, I, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about the logistics of, you know, fruit and vegetables and where we're getting those from. Um, talk about Constantine a little bit, the guy who rides his bike here twice a week with huge pallets on the back with fruits and vegetables, uh, not vegetables, he's just the fruit uh, delivery guy. Uh, but berries, and I, I have some pictures that uh, one of our residents, Nakia, took of uh, different fruits and things we were cooking in the kitchen. So while you're talking, I'm going to share my screen um, and show a little of those pictures and then come back to you uh, while you're talking. So Emma, if you could talk to us about, um, about how it works a little bit. I mean, literally what I'm saying is like everybody in the house pays in a, a pretty low amount of money a month and we pool all of our money and it creates our budget and so just starting there um, I'd love why to is it different yeah why is it different like if everyone puts in you know some money and then we buy a lot of stuff how does that work so that we all of a sudden have so much food and so much quantity and the quality is so much better how are you able to do that and how does it not turn into you know, every everyone seems to have everything that they want here. I mean, I love to eat. There's all kinds of great food. You brought in a huge smoked salmon yesterday. Like, that's a, a huge treat for me. And then you were like, no, we got plenty of money for that. We can get those whenever we want. Like, can you talk about how that actually works? Because for me, that is the most magical part of communal living. And you're, you're right in the center of it, helping us make that all happen. Yeah, so... Um this model that we are working on and have been working for for the last year is um, based on my experience in Italy, actually. I cooked there for uh, 12 artists living together in the Italian countryside on 5 euros a day per person. And that actually allowed for everything to be really plentiful because of a, a couple different factors, which really are reflective to how we do things here, which is eliminating waste is a really important one there. And when you have people that are not all buying things separately, um, 
things aren't going bad and like we have really minimized the amount of things that like go bad in our refrigerators. Um, also when you're able to buy through the economy of scales and be able to buy more at a time. For example is um, Constantine is a perfect example of like the opportunity this man um, has a business um, but purchasing fruit from farmers markets and um, sharing it with um, different people go ahead and purchase those fruits for him so we give him a budget of how much that we uh, want and then with that he can negotiate with farmers on the um, using the economy of scale of like oh well I can buy a case of those cherries and he can get a better price if he's buying a case of them and then having them split up between three houses versus them just going but then if you are going individually to a farmer's market and buying one small bag. Um, so the economy of scale, the, um, the elimination of waste, and also just like something that I think is really reflected for anyone who's lived with a roommate. We were just talking about this earlier this morning. Um, so much of like disagreements or like, you know, strife or like things like that can happen about like my stuff, your stuff. Like, if those are my eggs, don't use my milk, like, all of those kinds of things. But when you open yourself up to the possibility of just using what you need and making sure, like, what all of us need is plentiful, like, it really allows for a greater connectivity with the people that you live with and also, like, a more harmonious living environment and also, like, just the really beautiful possibilities of sharing and really stepping outside of that at box that limits us to the my stuff your stuff and really seeing past that and like this is ours together that we're building yeah you know I had that experience when I first got here and I know I talked to uh, a couple of our other residents at the same time we were having this um, same kind of issue, you know, I've had, uh, everyone's had roommates or everyone who's had roommates knows what it's like to share the fridge and everybody does it different, you know, some people have their own shelves, I've lived in a, uh, with a roommate before where we each had our own shelves and then we just each had our own stuff and even when we bought the same stuff, um, we would have our own so we duplicated stuff and sometimes even living with one person I used to wonder like why don't we just buy a bigger bottle of milk rather than two different things of the same exact milk and have it go bad or be on two different shelves. Um, I've also been in houses where, um, you know, everything kind of gets shared but not enough of the right things are being bought and vegetables are going bad, there's being over, you know, shopping. We seem to do really well here with um, you know, figuring out how much of everything we need and adjusting as necessary. Um, so I wanted to ask you and John, because um, I'm still not sure if Sean can come on uh, the call, but how did it work at the beginning? Like, has it been easy? How, how Were there challenges um, in order to actually make it work? Was there hit or miss, or did you kind of hit the ground running and you you knew how to do this right away because for me it's just an extraordinary you came with a truckload of stuff yesterday um, you know including that smoked salmon like lots of food so you know everything from Asian noodles and things you can stir fry with and sauces and just we have all the grains and foods I mean our kitchen is fully stocked uh, like I haven't seen since I lived in my parents house growing up you know and it brings such a, I want to talk from my own experience as a resident um, and, uh, you know, not just a community builder here, but like as somebody who's living here and experiencing this from the inside, um, how it's been for me coming off a year of couch surfing and changing my life and moving to a new city, um, not yet ha at the time having the budget to, um, to live in the city, so I had a choice of either move far away or find another situation and because I had lived in communities before I kind of had this feeling that things were possible and when I met Sean and John and we started talking about um, you know John I want to get you back in for this one about um, 
Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We, and we talked about that, I remember, in our first phone conversation before I moved in. And uh, at the time, we had a great talk about that. And I believe it went back to, I don't know if it was at the beginning when you and Sean created Vinyasa Homes or if this kind of evolved later, but I wanted to ask you, um, is this a philosophical experiment from your perspective? Is it something like, is there something about our society or our culture that you personally um, believe there's a better way and you're trying to create a better way? Um, or are you just kind of doing this for fun? Or like, what, what's your motivation? Uh, because I know that you have motivation and what I, I want to open it up and have you share some of that because you have some really interesting philosophy about um, what happens when people have a certain level of stress about their daily survival and how, you know, uh, you can't get the best out of people when they're struggling for the basic necessaries of life. And it seems like, it, to me anyway, for you it was almost a mission that you wanted to create an environment where people didn't have to struggle for the necessaries of life and could actually enjoy some of the finer things in life at an affordable cost and is that the experiment is like see what happens when people don't have to scramble anymore or is there something else going on because I know that your mind has a lot of unique perspective on why you wanted to build a community and I'm hoping we can get into that uh, yeah yeah that's uh, that's the type of question I like to answer um, cool. So in terms of uh, Maslow's hierarchy, there are traditional things like food, water, warmth, and shelter that all humans need. And um, we, I mean, I, I can really speak best for myself, but uh, one of the shared visions I think we've definitely all brought uh, together is this idea that, you know, we've for a long time been under the impression that the world it has scarce resources or, you know, life will end at some point in time that's outside of our control and that brings, you know, anxiety um, or angst to the human condition. And, you know, we, we hoped to kind of buck that trend and just say, if we, if we can support one another for the basics, if we can provide structure or foundation, as in the pyramid or the hierarchy of needs, then ideally each of us should have the, the roots or the, the structure upon which to build great collaborative projects. Um, and so that's a lot of the reason that we came in to, to handle the things regarding living um, in terms of food, water, warmth, and shelter. Um, and so we're strong believers that when those things are accounted for, um, one, it gets us out of this idea that um, the world is, is, is full of scarce resources because it's not really. The world is an overly abundant um, ecosystem that continually feeds into itself. And so things like need or not having um, the necessities really doesn't come down to a lack of the capacity of the world to provide. It comes down to a distribution problem. And so our hope, specifically through, through what Emma does, but also through what so many others do in the community, is that we can help by actively giving into the community and helping co-create. We can make sure that those get to where they need to go. And so our hope is to really fundamentally empower ourselves and one another um, to say, hey, you know, I saw this thing uh, out in the garden or I saw this thing walking up the street and I think it would go really well in this space. And so that's an essence of both physical and emotional and spiritual space in the sense of co-creating our living space. That's a step above and beyond the four necessities. And so that comes into self-actualization, self-realization, and that contributory co-creation kind of thing that we're seeking to get after. All right, awesome, thank you for that. Um... And it looks like Sean is on, but I'm seeing the icon. I'm not seeing his video. Um, and Sean, by the way, is not on an Ethernet connection. Uh, I think he's on Wi-Fi, and it must be a, uh, a slow connection or something from Europe. But I'm really glad we opened with Sean. He got to say some stuff, and hopefully before the end of the show, uh, he'll be able to come back on. Um, 
I got some questions from uh, from one of our viewers. Um, actually, uh, AJ, who lives here, um, sent in uh, a question. I think I can select it here and be able to look at this question. Um, so it says, I, uh, I think it would be interesting to hear the obstacles that Sean, John, and eventually Emma had to overcome in order to make vinyasa homes work and what they had to give up in terms of work and time. Um, and I think that's a great question. Uh, so I want to thank AJ for typing that question. And I want to ask, um, let's open that up to Emma first um, in terms of answering that question. Have you guys had to make personal sacrifices in order for the greater good of the community? And can you talk a little bit about um, what those are? Um, you know, I don't know if they're, I would really consider them sacrifices as much as um, an evolution. I think for each of us, it became very clear that we had to shift the way we thought about like personal space and like become very trusting of one another and of um, the possibility. We had a trust in the process and the possibility here because it was a lot of risk for each of us. Um, just in the amount of time that we've put into this, and the finances that we've put into this, into um, you know, just like a really personal investment has gone into the work that we've done here, and I think um, I I have a hard time calling it a sacrifice because I sacrifice means I think that I'm like losing out on something. Um, to be a part of this, and I don't feel like I've lost anything as much as I've just found something better. Yeah, you know, that's a really good point um, as well. You know, I think a lot of people, a lot of my friends who have seen me uh, live and change uh, my living situations drastically, you know, from living in luxury to living in, uh, in a pot under a tree to small apartments to sharing uh, with larger groups, and now in this new community, um, and I get a lot of the questions a lot about what you know what what's the draw? Why do I keep looking to come back? And, and because a lot of times in a lot of the communities I lived in in the past, and you know again, oh cool, we got Sean back here. Um, a lot of the communities I lived in the past, I don't think we're anywhere near well as thought out as you know you guys have thought this out. And you know I see um, you know I see Sean and John on their laptops and sketching things out all the time and constantly planning what's the next phase of this community, how are we going to expand to the double floor, how are we going to get 12, 15 new people in in a short period of time, um, how do we work the finances, let's restructure the, the membership structure. Um, so this is way more than what I've experienced in the past which is, you know, one or two people renting a space and then subletting it. There's so much more goes into this, um, particularly in how do we create the opportunities for people here. Uh, and this leads into uh, what we're going to talk about on future shows. And a lot of the future shows, um, I'm hoping to have you know as many as we can get ten people at a time on these hangouts on air. So I'm hoping uh, to find a time in the schedule. It might have to be at night, maybe after 8 o'clock Pacific time when people start to come home from work. Um, but I'm hoping to find a series of times where people in all of our houses among the 24 of us here and the uh, 12 to 14 of you down in uh, Redwood City, um, that we can get 10 people, 8 to 10 people on these hangouts and do real community building and actually share that with our greater audience where you know we're still getting to know each other and there are people with expertise in all different areas here and so what I'm hoping these future hangouts are going to be are opportunities for people to come on I'm going to talk to them like I'm talking to you guys kind of get their backstory why they're interested in community how they found you guys um, if they're working on any special projects, I already know there are several uh, people who live in our community who are already working together on outside projects and having success with it. And it's, it's, it's so exciting 
to see. AJ, who asked that question before, uh, is a fitness trainer and he's developing a really special app around fitness and he's already teamed up with other guys uh, in the house um, who are working with him and uh, so we're going to have him on in a future show. Um, everybody who wants to come on and talk about what community means to them. For me, I'm just excited that um, all of the passion that I have for using online tools, for instance, the fact that we're all together on this call right now, um, that you guys are open to sharing uh, our best practices and our discoveries with other people. Um, it's an extraordinary uh, show of trust and good faith that all of us you know, said, you know, we're making this up as we go along. We're planning things we can plan in advance, but a lot of times it's an experiment. But we have enough faith in each other that we can go live on air and just talk about this stuff. And I hope that it's as valuable to everyone as I think it is in terms of hearing uh, a different way to live. So for me, living in the middle of San Francisco now and being able to chase my dreams, um, I came here uh, without a job. I came here looking for a job, uh, a specific job. I had created a product um, called Ninja Blog Secrets where I teach people how to do personal branding and use online tools. Um, and here's a little quick screenshot of uh, the product right there. I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, but I came up here having just finished this and I approached UC Berkeley where I'm now teaching a WordPress mastery course and it was my dream uh, to do that. And living here in this house now uh, has afforded me the opportunity to really chase my dream, build my coaching practice, um, get my product sales up, uh, start teaching at Berkeley, which I just started this week, and at the same time come home to almost a family type feel where you know every day I'm truly excited when people come home at the end of the day or when I'm gone and I come home and there's someone in the kitchen and there's always somebody to talk to about what they did that day and everybody is doing cool stuff here and it's so inspiring from programmers and people working on artificial intelligence projects. Uh, Forrest is working on computer um, artificial intelligence and we have uh, programmers. We've got a product manager working at Apple. We've got uh, Sean. Uh, you used to work at Tesla. Um, let me get Sean on. Well, uh, can you hear me, Sean? Can you go uh, unmuted? And I'm so glad you're able to make it back on the call. Um, I'm going to show one more question uh, that AJ typed in that uh, hopefully you can uh, take, Sean. Um, a brief expo, please, on the long-term vision of Vinyasa and Community 2.0 uh, would be interesting to hear and how far you guys are looking to take this. Um, uh, you know, let's get into that in a little bit, but I, I, I'm looking to hear more from you about, you know, why did you leave Tesla uh, or a big company like that and, and come into community building. Um, I know you walk the talk um, and you're doing this and what are you doing in uh, London and what are you going to be doing in Barcelona? I think that ties into AJ's question about where you're going to take this. Um, so let's talk about that. Why are you in Europe right now? Uh, how does that fit into this community building thing? And, um, and why did you and John decide to leave well-paying careers to do this experiment. I mean, that's fascinating, and I really want both of you guys to talk about that a little bit. You guys made a radical shift in your lives. I can't believe it just happened willy-nilly. There must have been a lot of thought going in, and if we could just get some insight into that, uh, I think it would be fascinating. So, Sean first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, kind of throughout this whole process, and my bandwidth might have been an issue, so I kind of turned off my video. Hopefully that kind of gave everybody a smoother experience. At least for me, it was able, you know, able for me to... Uh, to hear everybody talk. Um, but yeah, so I can't help but kind of think about um, kind of at least another project that's really kind of in interests me a lot, which is the uh, the downtown project, which is something that Tony Shea is working on right now in terms of kind of revitalizing downtown Las Vegas and turning it into kind of a um, just this community-driven hub, you know, and, and kind of there are three C's, if I, if I re recall correctly, are um, collision, co-learning, and connectedness. And it kind of just occurred to me to how, you know, how similar you know, many of our values are to, to their values, right, as it relates to 
the, this this kind of this this serendipitous kind of connection between folks, you know, through shared spaces, right? That that collision, um, the co-learning, you know, again, that comes just about having just these just everyday, you know, constant in, interesting conversations with folks. You you never you never know what you're going to learn, and and again, just this fundamental idea of connection and the fact that you you can feel like you belong to something substantial and something meaningful. You know, and and if you kind of look at those, you, it really trivializes any obstacle or any challenge that kind of comes your way. Um, but I guess a fourth C I almost kind of think of sometimes is a little bit crazy, right? You've got to be, you've got, you, I mean, because when you put it kind of from the, this perspective of like, you know, leaving a nice job and 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 you know, spending a lot of time with without at least any any um, notion of immediate material reward, uh, you know, it, it is a little bit crazy to think about. And you know, I guess my my best answer really comes down to just just understanding, like, you know, you you have at your hands the opportunity not only as somebody in in my position, but anybody who's a part of this community to to kind of just create a culture of 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 this collaborative choosing where you know you you can truly feel like you can you can you can really just provide your own you, you know your your own unique perspective. And your own value, and and as a result of that, kind of create something that is truly your own. Um, and and I think that you know even even at some of the great the great companies these days, um, there there is a bit of a struggle there. There is a lot you know a large barrier as it relates to kind of putting yourself in a position to create impactful and meaningful things. You know, and I think that when when presented with an opportunity like this um, through through our projects here, uh, it really makes it easy for folks to just come right in. And provide mutual value, shared value, and I think that's really what it you know what it's all about. And to kind of tail you know to to segue into the second part of that um, around the idea of of this trip that I'm kind of embarking on right now, um, it it really kind of it, I add another C is is kind of culture you know kind of looking at what what's the cultural ROI you know how can I kind of justify being away because it is a difficult proposition sometimes kind of being away from the community physically being away. Uh, you know, not being a part of the experience. Um, but I think the, the best thing I can I can I can say to that is 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 how many more kind of like minds can we kind of bring bring together to have continued conversations around this new movement. Um, and and again, you know, how can we put ourselves in in positions of serendipitous learning and experience and knowledge gathering? Um, and, and you know, I think that's that's really one of the core values there, and and one of the big reasons why it's it's valuable to 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 embark on these different types of these research trips, if you want to call them that, um, but but yeah, so just you know, coming coming to these really really great cultural hubs, you know, cities like London, cities like Barcelona, Berlin, um, and then embarking on a really really amazing adventure with Emma, uh, where we'll be going to a conference in Croatia. Um, just kind of subjecting yourself to to new environments, um, you know, and and just kind of allowing yourself the opportunity to learn from folks all sorts of different perspectives and walks of you know walks of life and so um, let, let me yeah. ask you uh, that that's really interesting because what I'm what I'm thinking of and I'm wondering to get your input and I'd love to get John's take on this too um, and Emma's take on this too it you know we hear a lot of people talking about the uh, economy what's wrong with America or we're going in the right direction or the wrong direction. It's not a political thing what I'm talking about necessarily, but just where we're at as a culture in terms of what our values are. Um, do you feel fundamentally, uh, Sean, first, that there's something, is there something wrong with America? Is there something wrong with our culture? Is communal living and the sharing economy the answer to that? How does it fit? Like, what we're do are we renegades or are we pioneers or are we just kind of radical experimenters is there like I understand the method behind the madness going back to what John was talking about about the hierarchy of needs um, you know there are a lot of different ways to live and living comfortably um, can be defined in a lot of different ways by a lot of people sometimes it's a lot of personal space equals comfort in this case it's not but it's shared space being lovely space and productive space um, and being having access to um, the finer things in life you know the most modern kitchen and laundry appliances for instance or you know great Wi-Fi or uh, the ability to 
have amazing food like Emma's is planning. So those things actually are I'm finding solutions to problems. I'm interested if this is something like that can be taken to a different model. Like what about people who live on the same block and they're not living in community, they live in different houses. Like is this a model, this food sharing model that could be incorporated in neighborhoods around the country for people who don't live in the same house? Um, Emma, what do you think about that? <coughs> oh, don't forget to unmute yourself, Emma. Oh, I accidentally turned off the video instead of unmuting myself. There we go. Um, so yeah, I can talk about that a lot. So what we are working on is to create a, a model that I've never seen before um, that is scalable and that is op like authentically open source. Um, this is a really fascinating project for us, but I think it's a very important project for us, one as a community, but for us as individuals as well. Um, we are coming to a time where, where gasoline and um, drought and stuff like that are going to heavily, are already heavily affecting um, the price of food in America and specifically in California and will continue to do so. So what we're creating right now is trying to uh, really bring us together in this these uh, principles of the sharing economy allow us to purchase things together, use the economy as scales to our advantage, and um, really, just really take advantage of, of being able to live in abundance with each other and with being able to share. And this is a really, really fun and, and neat opportunity for all of us. And um, yeah, so a lot. Absolutely, what we're working on is, is to be um, shared, open source, and we're really trying to create the model that can be translated to a lot of different people. And I think the goal is in like, we have set up a community where we are taking care of like all of the different aspects of living together, um, together. Um, but I think ideally with the food program that we will create a model that can be scaled for friends or neighbors who want to cooperatively buy food together. If parents have their kids going together, like going to school together at the same preschool, I want them to be able to take this model as well and purchase food for their families together. I really see this as being a much larger kind of um, opportunity for us to, to, to make things life easier and better and more abundant. Yeah, I mean, I really am feeling that myself from what I'm seeing here. It, I'm just seeing the possibilities for families and neighborhoods all over the country, um, you know, to be able to actually learn from this and, fig and us help them um, figure out how to make things better so that each family, you know, we are a collection of uh, neighborhoods and families and we are a society but it, you know life is what we make it so like what I love about what Sean and John have done here is created this micro economy that all of us are sharing in and I just see so many opportunities here so John if you could jump in and um, talk about that what I was just talking to Sean about is this kind of do you feel like there's you know I it's a simple question but like is there something wrong with our society or is it just that um, the stresses of, of life have and, and overpopulation or whatever has caused certain things or do you think that there it's a value-based deficiency um, and is communal living the answer to that or is is the sharing economy it's part of communal living but it's also separate and I, I'd love to shine some light on that in the time we have left. We've only got a few minutes left. Um, so just uh, your final thoughts kind of on how communal living fits into the sharing economy and how the sharing economy can fit into the larger economy for people who aren't communal living but who are fascinated with the ideas of sharing and what that might mean for them. Mm -hmm. um, interesting question. So three questions today are all kind of wrap around the same answer um, from the way I see it. Um, 
I, I don't think there's anything wrong with America in the soapbox kind of kind of way. Um, but I do know there's uh, there's an element of being human, and so it it crosses borders and boundaries and nationalities. Um, and it's this this inner drive and desire to to do good, and it's something that each and every person really does have. If you look at one thing that makes all of humanity equal, it's the ability to see one's own motives and one's own reasoning, and it's it's that self-rationalization that often leads people to live the lives the way they do. And I think most people are really guided by this idea of trying to make the world a better place. And this comes into the AJ's question earlier, which thank you for asking both. Um, you know, the what kind of risks um, and what what kind of crazy sauce did you did you eat to to go down this path? Um, and I think it it really comes down to to wanting to to live a life that matters. And I've been blessed and cursed at the same time with having a very uh, hyper realized sense of self mortality. Um, I've had diabetes since I was a boy, and it's a risk I live with. But I know I wouldn't be where I am today or know anything about food and nutrition and about fuel without having walked that path. Um, and so I, you know, I really think that it comes down to to realizing um, by putting your time into something with others who can see a dream and a, a reality and can co-collaborate and co-create um, a journey or an experience um, really kind of defines uh, what drives the human the human heart and. Um, you know, it's it's really kind of based on that idea that a lot of a lot of people define our generation today um, as a generation that's focused not on ownership and possessions, but on experiences and connections. Um, and that's a lot of what I think Vinyasa Homes is all about. It's this idea that we share our space, we share our resources, we share our time, our quietude, and it's all based on this general idea that. If you really do live and breathe with one another, you follow a similar rhythm. But it's like a garden where you have some people putting in this and taking out that, and others contributing this and taking out that. And if you really allow everyone to give most fully and authentically, you really end up with the most vibrant and diverse ecosystem you can hope for. That's really nice. So it's really about um, bringing people in letting them be themselves, um, share their value with others, collaborate. Um, and you guys have been extraordinary with this. You brought us uh, together, an amazing group of people, and I'm really excited for anyone watching this uh, for our future Hangouts we're going to be doing. And we're going to be doing um, at least once a week of these. I'm going to open up this uh, this platform to allow community building to happen, and we're, this is an experiment in itself. You know, I honestly um, just started telling people about this, and I'm hoping people are going to watch this in the community and feel like, wow, okay, I'd love to come on and uh, and talk and share my thoughts and talk with others. Uh, really excited about the opportunities to see what kind of uh, talent and passion and share what we have here with each other and with others. Um, we're going to cut this uh, short at about the hour point, and we're going to call it a show. So before we go, um, I just want to ask each of you to just take about 30 seconds and share any kind of last thoughts or messages that you would have with anybody watching um, or any thoughts that you want to share that we didn't cover today. And then we could pick those up in another show if there's things that you were uh, hoping to talk about and we didn't talk about or anything you just want to uh, share with anybody. Let's do Sean first, and then John, and then Emma. Yeah, great. So I guess um, a couple of things related to, one of, one of which kind of was related to um, food a little bit. You know, thinking about, you know, how, you know, how are we making the world a better place, I guess, you know, um, because everyone wants to feel like they are in some way, shape, or form. Um, but but a kind of an anecdote to the food component is you know I would love to kind of see um, packaging waste you know just the cut just the amount of packaging waste we've been able to cut down 
through through the models we've implemented around food is is astonishing, you know. And I'd love to kind of like maybe build something that kind of measures the volume or or mass of of the waste that we produce because I tell you what we don't produce much, and there are a lot of folks that live here, you know, live there, you know. So um, so that's kind of anecdotal. Um, and then and then kind of second, you know, around impact both internally, you know, for the community and externally. I think um, one of the challenges, you know, for us as we try to, you know, maybe quantify the impact that we have and how we are changing the world, um, it can be a bit of a challenge, right? Because you know, I had an interesting conversation with somebody a couple weeks ago uh, around this subject, and you know, what they told me was like, well, can you quantify kind of a shift in consciousness? You know, I was like, oh, that's an interesting point. I don't know if you can, but but I think that one of the core values, you know, here, you know, what, what it is we're doing right now is around this kind of storytelling, con you know, component, you know, where people come onto this platform and, and share a little bit about themselves, what makes them tick, why they're in the community, um, you know. So part of it's just I want to express some gratitude to you, Evan, for you know having the volition to kind of put this together for us and and enable this platform of exchange, um, because I think this will be one of many salient reasons why, um, you know, we are changing the world through impactful conversation and through connection through these these nascent platforms that you know we're completely kind of unfamiliar with you know in many ways so uh, so yeah awesome thank you so much Sean and thanks for participating today and making time on your trip to to be on this call uh, and share your experience it's really special um, that we have this Google technology that is allowing us to connect uh, with each other across the you know seas and that we're going to be able to continue to uh, coordinate while Sean's traveling for the next several weeks and I love that so it's like he's gone but he's still here and uh, we can still talk to each other and we can talk face to face and other people can watch us um, so let's uh, hear from John any last thoughts here before we sign off today uh, yeah so let me start off and say Evan thanks for hosting the space and creating the space and Sean and Emma thank you for both for being here and again for collaborating and helping create the Vinyasa Homes project. Um, so some things I'd like to talk about in, in a future Hangout on Air would be, um, first and foremost, would be the Community 2.0, which is uh, it's basically the organization um, out of which the Vinyasa Homes project is just one of many important hubs. Um, and so Community 2.0, we essentially call it uh, the social network for the greater good. And it's a lot, it's oriented towards a lot of projects like this, what we call movements. Um, and so this is just our co-living movement within that greater picture of connection. Um, and then something that's near and dear to my heart and very personal is um, the urban food and food network, like, like food security and food justice, um, and I, I have another, uh, like a blog out of which I'm hoping to launch soon enough um, that's called I Feed Myself. And uh, it's based on that Silicon Valley, New York, LA question like, oh, what do you do? Who do you work for? Um, what are your connections? And uh, it's about self reliance and that personal journey um, that I think a lot of people in our generation are really reconnecting to the food uh, that fuels our lives. And so it's a lot about food justice and it's about urban farms and I mean how to grow and how to cook and how to prepare food for yourself. That's amazing. I, it would be amazing to spend time on that. So I look forward to doing that and uh, bringing in uh, other perspectives as well, other farmers and uh, people from all over the country. Hopefully they'll come and join us and talk in a series of roundtables about that. Um, I know that John, you're going to be going away uh, when Sean comes back to California. You're going to be going away and uh, and doing some farming again. I know you love that, so I can't wait to hear about that more uh, as the time gets closer. Uh, so thank you so much, John, for making the time to come here as well, and for John and Sean for being here. I'm going to open this up to Emma for last thoughts, and then I'm going to do the quick wrap up. Um, and so we'll be uh, off the air in about three minutes. Uh, Emma, go ahead and let us know. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time and for driving up here from Redwood City uh, and to be on this call. I know you could have done it from down there, but we're really happy to have you here because um, you know it's just nice that we're all the three of us are all here in the same house 
right now, and Sean is there in, in London, but I, I really feel like we're all sitting together right now and having a powwow, and um, I just love that. So go ahead, Emma. What's your thoughts here on uh, this Hangout, on anything you think you want to leave uh, the audience thinking about, and uh, if there's anything you'd want to talk about on the next one, uh, feel free to chime that in as well. Um, thanks so much, Evan. So I think um, Sean and John have really done a great job of covering some of the stuff that um, uh, food stuff to leave people with, and it's um, as you can probably tell, we're all really into food at this place. Um, but I think one of the most important things to know and to be left with about the Vinyasa Homes Project, um, to be really clear, is. I mean, the real goal is to, to foster the connection of people, places, and ideas, and to host just paradigm-shifting experience for people. And that's through the living experience, that's through the food experience, that's through all of the challenges and stuff. Um, community is not easy. No one's going to tell you it's like a really easy thing to do, and it's like really just a turnkey kind of plug-and-play situation. People are going to tell you it's hard, but at the same time, you can ask any of us and most people who are really connected and in, in deep into these intentional communities and the sharing economy that it's really the most worthwhile way for us to live our lives, um, and it's just been a real privilege. Uh, that is uh, a beautiful note to end on, and I just want to thank all three of you uh, for taking the time and coming and talking to me today and opening up this channel. Uh, I want to tell everybody, our audience, that our website, vinyasahomes.org, is uh, up and running. You can read about our two different locations. You can apply to live here if you want to experiment in communal living and you're in the Bay Area. Um, we have a site called vinyasahomes.org slash TV. And you can actually watch this video uh, after the fact, in just a few minutes after we're over. It's going to become a YouTube video um, automagically, as my friend Ronnie Bincer says, uh, the Hangout Helper. And uh, basically, anyone who wants to watch this, come to vinyasahomes.org. You'll be able to click through from there to the Google page. If you have questions that you want to type in for us and you're watching this after the fact, uh, go ahead and type your questions in in the Q&A box and every once in a while we'll come and monitor the page and if we see questions that we haven't answered we'll reach back out to you and get you involved, maybe even have you on a future episode of the show. Um, so that's it for today for the Vinyasa Homes Project TV. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Thank you for my special guests. Um, and most of all, thank you John and Sean and Emma for creating a beautiful home-like environment that honestly for me particularly and individually um, for the first time in a long time I was hosted by some really wonderful warm friends of mine uh, while I was uh, adjusting to life in San Francisco and looking for where I was going to be living and I can truly say how happy I am to be home really feels like uh, a warm home you guys have created here. I already love you guys like family. All of my housemates feel like family, and I believe we all feel that way from each other, and it happened in a very short period of time. You guys are extraordinary human beings that you've had this vision. You put your names on the dotted line. You created something out of faith, and you've allowed us all to step into this and experience this, um, and you have my deepest gratitude for that. So thank you. Uh, for being here. Thank you for watching. This is the first episode of vinyasahomes.org. Look out for a next episode in community building that's going to be uh, next week, maybe Thursday or Friday. It'll be at night, probably 8 p.m. Pacific or something when uh, more people are home. Uh, I'm not going to announce the specific time yet because I'm going to coordinate, try to get as many people as possible on the next call, uh, and it's going to be a lot of fun going forward. So we'll see you at the next episode of vinyasahomes.tv and we'll see you soon. Thank you, everybody.